I'm Abbott Morgan, and I learned the fascinating truth about the income tax at LostHorizons.com. Then I filed a tax return knowledgeably for the first time in my life. Now, I haven't gotten all my money back yet, but as soon as those accurate returns went in the mail, I got back my dignity as a confident, self-governing, free American. And I did that by reading this. Cracking the Code, The Fascinating Truth About Taxation in America by Peter Hendrickson. Now, you will not regret picking up a copy of this bad boy right here. One of the best books I've ever, ever read. So, enjoy, and happy reading, Cracking the Code. I decided that, okay, I need to find what the truth is. And for me, it was important to know the truth, regardless of what my desire was for that truth to be. It was really important that I find the truth, even if it went against my best interest. If the truth was that I ended up owing a ton of money, so be it, if that was the truth. But if the truth was that I didn't know it, I wanted to know. <laughs> And so I just, I just literally, I just prayed about it because I got, I was hitting a brick wall over and over again. I kept finding what sounded good, but was just not, it just didn't seem legal to me. It didn't seem right. And I have a lot of respect for the law. So I finally came across the, this website that, that showed me, okay, these are a lot of fallacies about the law. Here's what the law actually says. And then I thought, well, that's not even good enough. I want to know what the law says. And then I started reading the law. And I just believe in my heart that knowledge is power. And that if you know what the law says, the law that you are beholden to, the law that you are expected to obey, not, especially when, it's not just when the, when the law tells you not to do something, if it forbids something, you should know those laws. But you are also responsible, and it's in your best interest to know the laws that require you to proactively do something. It's really important to know what those laws say. And I would say that most people in this country not only don't understand the, the tax laws that they are trying to comply with, but probably learned about how to file a tax return from their mom, you know, from their uncle. <laughs> they certainly didn't learn it by reading the law that has to do with that. And it took me, I've, I've been filing incorrectly for 30 years. And when I finally figured it out, and I read the law, and read these definitions, and realized that they had nothing to do with me most of the time, that doesn't mean never. There are times when I could engage in taxable activity. It's possible. Things change from year to year. Anybody could be subject to income tax at any time. But most of us aren't most of the time. <laughs> I realized that. That's very liberating. So have you had some success with uh, anything with the IRS you'd like to tell? Yeah, yeah. 2007, I filed uh, my income tax return properly this time. And I got back every penny that was withheld from our pay for uh, including federal income tax, Social Security, and Medicare taxes. How many years back did you go? Just well, one? then I've also amended back to 2003. So I've amended some returns as well. And so we'll see what happens with those. I'm still duking that out. So you got back one year's worth and you're trying to get back another three? Well, I ha and I haven't filed for 2008 yet. I got an extension, so I'm going to be filing for 2008 and I expect to get all that back as well. Yeah, so, so you've already... And now, the good news is I don't itemize deductions anymore. I don't file schedules anymore. I don't save a stinking receipt. I don't have to. Because unless I anticipate that in that given year I'm going to make... You know, if you're married filing jointly, you have up to, it's like $12,000 if you consider your personal, your standard deduction and your personal exemptions that they give you without itemizing anything. That's about twelve grand in federal money that you can make and still have no tax liability. What's the point of keeping receipts and itemizing if, unless you have, unless you think to yourself, I'm actually going to be making more than $12,000 in federal income, in income, in wages, which are very specifically defined and are not all that comes in. <laughs> so yeah, you can, you might, I'd take 10 minutes to fill out a tax return now. Talk about the Paper Reduction Act. You'd think that they would put that on the Paper Reduction Act. Okay, <laughs> By so the way, it only should take you about 10 minutes to fill out. So, so you got uh, one year's back already and you 
when you file for next year, you expect to get that back. I haven't filed for 2008 yet, but when I do, I expect to get all of that back. And you've amended three years? I've amended for 2006, 2005, 2004, and 2003 because I'm from California, and 2000, California gives you four years to amend your return. Four years. Okay, so you're talking about state and federal, or just... Oh, just, yeah. Okay. I did a lot of tax returns. Stupidly, I did them all in one, <laughs> one day. I filed them all together. But, uh, yeah. You can go back three years, that's what the federal government says that you can have to get it right. And what do you believe, uh, or maybe I should say, what do you know uh, about, you say you're also getting your Social Security back. Now, so that that, that amount won't apply to your, when you go, do you, do you intend to collect Social Security if it's available to you to collect? Chances are, by the time I become 65, and I'm not going to tell you my age, but way in the future when I turn 65, <laughs> Um, the chances are that the Social Security uh, will not be in existence anymore. It's probably going to be done within the next 10 years. Okay, and then... And so, this... but that's not answering your question. So, to answer your question, I don't know yet if we would apply for Social Security, but hypothetically, if we chose to file for Social Security, we're already vested, which it's not really a vesting, but you're supposed to put in about 10 years of... Uh, 40 quarters. 40 quarters. We've already done that. So even if I don't pay in another dime to Social Security, I'm still entitled to full benefits at my retirement, Based regardless on... of what I put in now, or for the last three years. Even if I amend and say, you know, the truth, which is that I didn't actually get wages for the last four years, I still was long ago had my 40. And it doesn't matter anyway because it's it's a government dole program, and the government is bankrupt. It's not going to be paid out to me. If it is, it won't be for long. It's, I just don't think it's going to be an issue. But in my case, because of our age and because of how long we've been filing tax returns and, and getting it wrong and declaring that everything we've made, every penny that we've made is income, I put in my 40 units. In other words, I've paid enough to the government in taxes that I did not owe. And now I'm stopping that. I'm not doing that. Don't be daunted by the idea of reading the law. The definitions are just about as easy a piece of law as you'll ever read. It's a definition. Anybody can read that. But you go into a law library and it's just so massive. Wall to wall don't. books for Don't get it on get it online. It's all online now. Everything's been digitized now. You can get online. Just Google 26 USC 7701 and read it. 26 U.S.C. 3401, read about what wages really means. 26 U.S.C. 3121, read the definitions. 7701, read the definition of what it, what is the United States. That would be an eye-opener for you. And start to actually read these definitions. And when you do, and you realize that these things don't apply to you most of the time, or they might apply to you some of the time, but not enough to create a tax liability, it's an amazingly freeing thing. It's extremely liberating to understand how these laws do and do not apply to you. And then you can make your decision. Then if you choose to go ahead and continue to pay the government all this money, that's your choice. But don't do it because you don't pay these things in because you think you have to. And I say this with all love for people and all respect, but most people do operate out of fear and ignorance. And, you know, I've been, I've long been of the belief that that's no way to live your life. And um, if you, instead, if you decide that you're going to live your life out of faith and knowledge, um, your quality of life will improve dramatically. Arm yourself with knowledge, arm yourself with the law, and, and walk in faith and knowledge, and I think you'll be okay. Income tax law itself is constitutional as written. The operative words being as written, and that's the important point that people miss, especially people who want to believe, fervently, passionately want to believe that the tax law is unconstitutional, are missing an important point. Congress wrote the laws with the Constitution in mind, and any discussion of tax law has to start with Article I of the Constitution. That's where we start. This country was founded on a tax protest. Remember that. And so Congress very intentionally created limitations on the tax law for a reason. They were very intentional about how they wrote the law. The law itself is constitutional as written. It's the as written part that's important. If you look at the way these statutes are written, 
I've had people tell me, well, as soon as they figure out that they made that mistake, they're going to amend the tax law and they're going to close the loophole. Like the 16th um, Amendment, right? <laughs> well, no, like amending the tax law, meaning they're going to change the definition of state to include the 50 states because, oops, they forgot that part. Yeah. No. If that were to happen, if that were to occur, if they were to change one word of that definition, the entire Title 26 would become unconstitutional. You see? As written, it is not unconstitutional, it is lawful, and it only applies to very few people at any given time. That's the freeing thing, is find out what group you belong to. Do you belong to the group that actually owes the tax? And there are some. And in any given year, I might be one of those people. There was one year where we actually had unemployment compensation. That's taxable. We had income from a national bank. We had interest that we earned from a national bank. That is taxable. Did it create a tax liability for that year? Pfft, no, it wasn't $12,000 worth. It didn't overcome our, you see what I mean? It didn't overcome our, our standard deduction and personal exemptions. But, it, but we were duly reported it because it is taxable. But if you, but if you find out that you're not in that category of persons and, and, and engaging in that category of activity for that year, then you don't owe the tax, period. Doesn't mean the tax is unconstitutional or unlawful. It simply means it doesn't apply to you in that given moment. That's free. Ryan. Um, I live here in uh, southeastern Michigan and uh, about a while ago um, I was at a bar with one of my friends. She was having a, a birthday party. I was talking to one of her co-workers uh, that she brought there and the guy, we got into politics and things like that as uh, a lot of people have been doing lately and he starts talking about you know the income tax laws. I'm like, okay. He's like, you know, well, do you know the definition of this? Do you know that? And he's like, I'm like, no. And he goes, well, you know, you're not liable for the tax. And I got interested. Um, I was like, well, okay. You know, do you have any more information? Something I can, uh, you know, look up and research. He goes, yeah. So he gives me a website. Later that night, I go home. Uh, I go to the uh, website. It was LostHorizons.com. Or um, read through there. It looked pretty interesting. Um, bought the book. So I decided to read through the book, and and read it through. Um, kind of understand it, had to read it again and things like that. Then I decided, well, you know, if it's not really mine, let's see if it works. You know, I'm always the type of person, like, I can read something, it, it makes sense, but let's apply it. Um, so I decided in uh, 2009, I filed my um, 2008 tax returns using the information that I found from the book and applying it to my own tax situation. Well, it just so happened, um, the the state was kind of reluctant. They sent me a, uh, a notice saying that they'd only gave me a $200 refund. Well, in this time, the uh, federals came back um, claiming that uh, you know, they're giving me some hats on my return. Well, I filed them and said, hey, look, this is my testimonial. This is, this is the information. If you have any claim to make, make a claim with it. After I sent that notice and the state came back and gave me um, a notice of all $650 they refunded. I mean, I was kind of excited. I've been telling people at work, you know, I was, um, after reading this, I go, you know, if this is how it is, if, if we are only taxed on exercisable activities, um, you know, why are we doing it this way? Um, and I've applied it and, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've secured my state thus far. I'm still working with the federal, obviously. <laughs> Obviously, the IRS doesn't want their income stream to come away uh, based on ignorance, so they're going to fight it, you know, into t teeth and nail, which is what you expect from any government agency. Um, but uh, I guess on this day, you know, I always like to think of uh, Thomas Paine. You know, when he, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't, don't know the exact quote, but where he says, uh, it's not the function of the government to keep itself from going into error. It's the function of the citizen to keep the government from going into error. Um, and, you know, Lately, I like to think that we're all Americans. We all believe in liberty. We all believe in these values, these core values that seem to be every day being taken away from us. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't myself just stand there, learn something, and then not apply it. 
So that's what I did. I applied it and successfully won my state income tax return so far. And you expect to get your federal back too, right, eventually? Uh, eventually, yes. We'll see. I mean, you know, I've been researching on the internet what the IRS is going to throw on me. It's like a chess match. You know, you got to know a couple moves ahead on what you could get. You never know what they're going to throw at you. So I've been continuing doing my research. I'm a little bit prepared on what could be coming down the road. Um, some people have gotten their return back successfully in a short period of time. Some people have taken, you know, a couple years to get it back. But regardless, is that now I know the truth, I'll be applying it uniformly from here on out. You, you know? plan on mending previous years? Um, well, I haven't. I unfortunately made the mistake of not filing for 2007, so I have to file for that year. Um, and then amending, uh, I will be amending once I do more research, because um, I think you can only go back so far. Um, so if I'll go back to as however far as I can go. Um, by whatever the law allows. Remember, the first time I ever filed my taxes was 16. You know, you take your, you go get a job at where, whatever place, they give you these paperwork. You're like, okay, go down here. And I remember looking at the form, filling it out, and then the tax preparer is like, okay, well, you need to sign this. And I looked at the jurat, I'm looking at this, well, I'm signing this under penalty of perjury. You know, that this information is true, correct, and, you know, to, the, to uh, my personal knowledge, to be true. And something never stuck with me. Um, with that because I I guess maybe it's the way my parents raised me you know they're always like well okay if you like that idea go research it you know look it up I never looked at the income tax laws at 16 it's not, nothing that they teach you in high school it's nothing they teach you in college that's only something that you have to go out on your own on your own and research Hi, my name is Chris. Following one quick reading of Pete's book, I cracked the code. Before Pete's book, there were many years of study, followed by many trial and error applications, all of which resulted in failure to understand the federal income tax. Thanks to Pete, we now have a concisely and clearly written explanation of the income tax, which is fully supported by legal citations. I am very grateful to Pete because he helped me pursue one of my main goals as a Christian American, to maintain a clear conscience. In part, I'm referring to doing what I can to not be party to the mass murder and mass destruction campaigns that the federal government justifies on the basis of taxing we the people. They no longer have my money in support of their evil deeds. Now, I can still live in this country and not worry about God kicking my butt on Judgment Day or the IRS kicking my butt any day. Pete, thanks again for your fabulous contribution to Truth, Justice, and the American Way. Hi, my name is Val Smithson. After several readings of Pete Hendrickson's amazing book, Cracking the Code, in 2004, I filed a proper refund claim return for the year 2002. For the first time in my life, I lawfully rebutted an erroneous information statement and knowingly attested to the accuracy and truthfulness of my return. Shortly thereafter, I received a complete refund of all the federal withholdings taken from my pay for the year 2002. And for each year since then, each proper CTC-educated return that I have filed has renewed my dignity as an American citizen. I encourage you to read Pete's book several times if necessary. Learn to read and understand the law for yourself, and then apply the principles of law that apply to you. If you don't read Cracking the Code to learn how to know which provisions of the law apply to you, then you most likely are being subjected to provisions of law that do not lawfully apply to you. That is what inevitably happens when we're ignorant of the law. And ignorance is not bliss when you realize that all the property you have turned over to the government didn't need to be because you didn't take the time and effort to learn and understand what the law really says. So please get Pete's book, read it, study the law, and then knowledgeably reclaim your rights and property under that law as they apply to you.
Well, basically, um, I'm here today, I'm Pete's brother, and I've watched what he's uh, done over the years uh, from, a, from that uh, uh, a, a good vantage point because I've got continuity. I, haven't, I don't have a snapshot of him, I've got a, a long-running um, uh, interaction with him, and, I, and uh, when he first got started um, uh, putting to print his thoughts, which he had been developing over many previous years, when he had finished doing the research, when he was one of the first people to, uh, to search the newly digitized code, he was one of the first people to say, hey, there's now three and a half million words I can search. Uh, it was, I think, the year 2000 or something, he, and he went in and he started searching for keywords. Uh, when, when, when he began turning up the results that you see in his book, um, I said, you know, Pete, that's very interesting. I don't have the time to dissect what your uh, thesis is. I don't have time to, to cross-check it against, you know, anyth anything else uh, related. So I said, Come back to me maybe um, after a few years and after a few dozen people have have successfully used it because I just didn't have time to be bothered. But you know I'm interested from the sidelines. Well, now it's multi years later and he has many hundreds and hundreds and thousands. The hundreds and thousands are known. The tens of thousands are not known to us, but they are they no doubt exist because uh, the ordinary person receiving a refund is not going to send. A, their name and the uh, picture of their refund check into a third party like Pete, unless something really, you know, it's a much bigger movement <laughs> than than uh, than uh, meets the meets the eye. So I, I suspect there's a big, 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 big number, I, and who knows what that is. Um, but what's on what's on in print, what's been forwarded to him, is is considerable. And uh, he's not an author of just one book. He's an author of more than one book, and another one that I have on my shelf. Uh, is, is, is titled Upholding the Law. That's Pete. Pete is a thoroughgoing law upholder, and he is a, a strict um, logician. He is someone who um, uh, pretty much builds a, uh, if he's going to build a house around a concept, it'll be a brick house. It's not, not made out of straw. He, he has everything covered. And when I looked deeper and deeper into his claims on this, one matter about upholding the law, the tax law. Uh, again, he has essays on 25 or 30 different other elements of the law that are breathtakingly, they're spectacular uh, forays into clear-headed thinking. But in this one area on taxes, um, I kept expecting that at some point I would find, in my, in my own uh, reconnaissance, I, I'm sure I thought I would be sure to find something that would run contrary. And I, to this day, I have not found anything. All I found is repeated confirmations, repeated buttressing, and for the on the other side, on the IRS side, there is nothing. They are they cite no Supreme Court law. They cite uh, ludicrous, misdirectional uh, district court uh, precedent in their favor. They have nothing to go on. They have they have calumny. They have insult. And they have power. Um, that's about there are a couple things that I know um, uh, from my own research that run parallel to what Pete has done. And here, here's what I know about the period after 1913, when the income tax amendment was passed. I know that between 1913 and 1941, a maximum in any given year, um, there was a, there's a maximum number of Americans that paid income tax during that entire generation uh, leading into World War II. 28 years, 29 years continuous. Uh, no more than 8% of the public, and an average of more like 5% of the public, ever filed or paid an income tax return. In any given year, at the height of the Depression, when the government really needed money, it maxed out at 8%. The year of Pearl Harbor, 1941, again, 8%. That's it. And that bears a very strong relation to Pete's claim that only those holding a privilege under the federal government are obligated to pay the tax. State governments agreed that their employees should also pay the tax. They voluntarily agreed. There's, there's a statutory authority for them to collect income tax. And 8% is approximately the level of the population during all those years preceding Pearl Harbor that paid income tax or filed a return. 
It's rather curious. It must mean that the other 92% of all of our grandparents and great grandparents were tax cheaters or morons. They couldn't even they couldn't even understand their obligation to file a return. You see? Now, how could that be that 92 I guess they were just all morons or worse. They were cheaters. It's, it's just it's plain as day. Now, this is something that I happened on as I looked through some statistics at Pete's request. He was trying to find some statistical material, and I happened to find a mother load uh, in the congressional record, and I said, my God, <laughs> what's going on here? Well, then there's another little uh, related element that co cr comes into the picture in 1942. The year after Pearl Harbor, we, the, 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 uh, the U.S. government completes a year, 1941, where only 8% pay. And so in 1942, they employed the Walt Disney Company to do a theater short, a cartoon short starring Donald Duck, in order to urge Americans to file and pay income tax. They ran that, they spent $80,000, which was a princely sum in today's dollars, today's devalued currency that the government also, unfortunately, is manipulating, down, down, down. Well, 80000 was a princely sum in those days, and they rushed this thing into all the theaters, and uh, there was Donald Duck having an argument with his with his radio. The radio was saying, "There's a war going on. You must." It's talking to him. You know, you, you have to pay. Come on, all Americans should 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 pay a tax, and you should be one of those guys too. You should send in your bacon fat to the war effort. Send in your your recycled aluminum, tin foil, and your automotive tires. Don't buy tires for your car. And please send in tax. So they're urging Donald Duck, and of course, for 18 out of the 20 minutes, he's resisting, as Donald Duck always does. Uh, resisting good sense, and finally he agrees. Yeah, I think I, I will. And look, the radio is making it easy for me to fill out my form. Well, he sends in his tax, and he's so happy. Um, and at the end, of course, there's this uh, call to arms, something like uh, taxes to beat the axis, you know, something like that. Very uh, um, militant, uh, militaristic type of uh, tone to it. And you know, I studied this, I, I learned what happened with that same congressional record. I learned that in that year, 1942, at the height of World War II, with the nation in clear, in the greatest danger ever from Hitler and Tojo and so forth, 1942, when the war was no by no means won, when Hitler was triumphant and Japan ruled all of East Asia, at that point, income tax filings went up from 8% all the way up to 38%. All the way up to 38%. In other words, still a decided minority. Now, this ad tells me something. It, when you have to use a Donald Duck short to convince Americans, then maybe Pete's got a point that, that those who voluntarily send money into the government, the government will accept it. But those who discover that they're not obligated to do so, those people who pay sales taxes, pay property taxes, pay any kind of tax to which they know they're legally obligated, but find that this tax they are not legally obligated to pay, this out of all the taxes that they do pay, uh, maybe he's got a point. Pete is a taxpayer. He pays any tax that he is legally entitled to pay. And so, so this is another fascinating thing uh, that I learned. Um, I, I'm going to supplement that with a couple more things. Um, the IRS uh, doesn't want to hear that there is a definition for the word income. There's a definition for the word wages and that you are taxable on the income that you earn from, that's in quotations, a defined term in the statute is income. Uh, the income that you earn on defined term, quote unquote, wages. These are common usage terms, but in the statute, if a term is defined, then that term takes on the definition that the statute gives it, not the ordinary definition. And Pete realized that income and wages and many other terms are defined, and therefore he searched the code and he found out what those definitions meant, and they didn't apply to him or you or me. Well, so um, in that context, we have an IRS which is demanding that its understanding of the term wages and income and, and this stuff should all be taxed. It's that only its definition applies and, and they are just so much more knowledgeable than you and me. They're so much more 
uh, educated than you and me, and they have so much more power than you, and you'd better listen. Well, this same IRS lost in every court that they were exposed to. They lost on a word definition, a simple word definition. They lost on a definition uh, relating to the telephone excise tax that they had been collecting illicitly ever since the Spanish-American War. In that Spanish-American War, a tax was passed to support that war effort in 1898. A two-year tax, which then got just extended by default. They just kept collecting it. And that was a tax on telephone calls. The newfangled telephone in the year 1898 was a luxury. And they made a tax to support the war effort. And the tax was based on, uh, they, could, they could do an, an excise tax on telephonic traffic. That was where, wherever the, the telephone company charged based on distance rings and elapsed time of the call. I'm making a long distance call to California from Michigan. That's a distance ring. It's cheaper if you call inside Michigan, it's more expensive if you call to Ohio, and even more expensive if you call to California. And they were allowed to collect an excise tax if, if you recall, lasted 40 seconds, not 30 seconds, and if it was based on distance rings. Well, some high-powered lawyers working for very rich U.S. corporations realized in about the year 2002 that they were illicitly collecting this tax because there are no more distance rings. Uniformly across the country, AT&T charges the same rate whether you call California or down the street. It's basically, if, you, if the phone call lasts for some time, then they charge for that. But the IRS resisted and resisted. They won in some district courts because the judges were pushovers for the IRS. They sucked up to power and they, they took the IRS's statement whole. But other district courts said, no, these people are screwed up. And they, then they went to appeal and they lost in every uh, circuit court of appeals in the country. They lost six out of six. And these circuit courts of appeals said, you know, you can't mangle the definition of the word and to mean and or. And means and. And they laughed the IRS out of their courtrooms and the IRS lost every case. Because the IRS was saying, uh, just, we, we get to charge this excise tax. Um, if there's a distance ring based calculation and or if there's an elapsed time calculation so we're going to keep collecting that tax on all your cell phone calls even if there's no distance rings and these judges correctly said you are jerks and means and you have to have both conditions not one or the other and the irs was thrown out in six out of six because they their definition their self justifying self-aggrandizing definition was ludicrously plainly wrong self-serving and wrong and they had and they then uh, refunded a years worth of this tax to, to to the to the taxpayer in the year 2006 this is P who Pete is up against this is a de an agency that can't even get the word and right because they're self-serving they want your money and the, the illegal collections that they took over those 109 years since the Spanish-American War, if you put it in today's dollars, is a trillion dollars that they took in from the American taxpayer illegally by mangling plain definitions. And that's what Pete is saying. He's saying, I've read the definitions. The word income is a defined term, and it doesn't apply to most of us. The same thing with the word wages, the same thing with the word employer. And so when I get a W-2 from someone saying that I earned taxable wages from when my employer sends something like that into me. Okay. Pete doesn't take that and just swallow it. He says, I'm going to look up what the word wages means. And, it, and when he reads it, he says, I'm going to file a correction to my W-2. And he's allowed to do so. And the IRS plainly doesn't like this. That's Pete's case. Pete wants these people to come out of their fortress and talk about simple definitions. In the, that are simply on the books. And that's what I think, what I hope will happen. I hope that this nation of sheep gets a little bit of stiffened spine. Have you had some, your name is Matt, where are you from, Matt? Um, Michigan. Michigan, okay. Uh, have you had some success with the uh, IRS against uh, getting some refunds back? We are in. We are working on that for our, for a filed return. Actually, we have a couple of filed returns, and um, we, there's still some there's still some fixes to iron out with some account errors that uh, that were changed from when we filed that we're working on. And have you uh, 
So you haven't gotten any money back yet from your filing only, f only from um, a local return. State? But the, but the, the, state? the federal one. Oh, it's a city, actually. City, okay. Yeah. So this is for 2008? Uh, yeah, for 07. 07. And have you already filed for the state and, and federal for 07? Uh, yes, yep. Okay, and so you're not, that, you don't know yet on that? Right, it's kind of we're kind of waiting. And do you expect to get your social security back as well? Did you attempt to do that? That is that is part of the refund request. I mean, I've learned from reading the law, and you read about uh, I don't know how much, depending on what info you want, but um, the taxes, the FICA taxes, um, is um, are strictly applied to the receipt of wages as defined in the revenue laws. Okay. Uh, and it, they're also applied to self-employment income. I could say things in quotes because basically what a lot of I and a lot of others have learned is there are custom terms with a scope of application. And um, like a, a term used, once it's defined um, in legislation, uh, it gives it a custom definition and it doesn't necessarily mean any word that you could think of to be associated with that word. So um, like an example, like you said, Social Security and Medicare taxes, basically they're a tax upon income, a special kind of income called wages or self-employment income. Now I didn't say money, I said upon certain classes of receipts. And so if one didn't receive that kind of receipts or you know, or only a, a little bit maybe, they may be able to get the refund reading, back. But they're reading this book and, and also going beyond what the book says and reviewing the info on the website, but also researching and pulling the statutes he references, um, the derivation tables, um, revenue acts, judicial decisions, you know, you can pull them up on the internet, you can go to the library and research them. Um, they they uh, agree with what the information he's presented um, shows. So basically, um, I suppose the best way to say it is due to misinformation or maybe false information, where every, everyone assuming the world is flat when it's really round, but never bothering to really check into it, um, and using inference, uh, activities not taxable are However, colored if you as looking. Di didn't do the taxable activity, then you fill out the return properly based on what you did, and then you know it may result in a refund. In a lot of cases, it results for refund. Um, there's a case, you know, Rosamond versus United States. There's others. Um, basically, when one, let's say, money is taken from you during the year, like people say, you know, from your paycheck. You know, people call it withholdings or different things. The, the courts have clarified that those kind of payments are called payments in escrow. So they go into account for you, and they're kind of like, some would call it prepayments, or it's money set aside, and then if you have an eventual liability, it's applied to the liability, and whatever's left over um, gets refunded to you. So no tax is actually paid until an assessment's made, either when you fill out your return, or if you don't file a return at all, um, the IRS can make a return for you. Um, based on information available. So basically, it's your responsibility to report the correct information from your first-hand knowledge, you know, from what's, what's correct. If you, what? if you earn taxable income for performing activities are taxable, then you owe a tax on it. That's just how the law works. But now, if you don't, then, you know, then you don't. There is a, a, site, a court case called South Pacific versus Low, where um, the government was talking about a company. The government was arguing that um, all the receipts of this one company were automatically income, which is another term we've learned about recently. Um, but then the court said, we must reject in this case, as in a couple other cases, um, the broad contention submitted on behalf of the government that all receipts, all that comes in, are income within the meaning of the term gross income. So basically, um, you know, in learning and researching, um, basically it's kind of opened our eyes to see that uh, Custom terms um, that describe one thing are made to look like they apply to everything, and thus to make it look like um, everything that comes in there's, is there's income. A case called Brushaber versus Union Pacific Railroad, um, where a man tried to argue that the 16th Amendment, for example, um, was trying to tax everything that a person would earn and not apportion it at all. And the court uh, called that an erroneous assumption and, and was clarifying the scope of it, basically, that and they, they uh, confirmed how uh, it was a term with a limited scope of meaning and it didn't apply um, to everything that one does and it was in a contract like look at an insurance clause you know you know look at acts of God it has a definition you know total loss it has a definition there's definitions for so many things um, to give it there's there's a court case for example Mies versus Keene it says it's axiomatic that just means self-evident that the statutory definition of a term excludes unstated meanings of that term so basically when Congress creates um, creates a term for something, a definition, they give it its, its uh, the refund 
uh, the refund claim, and um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting and um, wow, it's a blend of I guess you could say excitement, interest, and maybe disgust at uh, a lot of this information could be more easily distributed to many many people. Hi there, my name is Sean Dorbors. I'm from Pittsburgh, New York, and in 2006, I read this book written by Pete Henderson from cover to cover. I had to read it three times to fully understand it, but since that time, I have filed knowledgeably, and the state of New York has responded by returning all of my withholdings that I've requested. Unfortunately, the IRS is slow on its feet, but I am patient because I know, in the end, the rule of law always wins. And this little statement here will have the power and significance that it once had. Thank you, Pete Hendrickson, for enlightening me. Thank you.